Oh, man, thank you. Thank you so much for coming out to this. Thank you, Zach. Uh, appreciate this so much. This is great. Um, yeah, if you haven't seen me before, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm from quite a small town in New South Wales called Jerringong. No one's ever surprised to learn I'm from a small town. I think people just kind of <laughs> sort of assume that about me for some reason. Like, been here 30 seconds, you can already, like, kind of tell I was in the Scouts. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> Some people kind of change up their look as they grow up. My look has stayed pretty consistently on boy about to have the adventure of a lifetime. It's just <laughs> locked in for me. Um, by the way, I'm so annoyed that joke still gets a laugh. That is like <laughs> by far the oldest joke I have in the act. <laughs> like as I've gotten a bit older, the look is sort of turning into a guy in movie about World War II who is way too excited about being in the war, then like definitely dies straight away. That's what I'm after now. <laughs> But I liked growing up in a small town. It was cool. There's a lot of fun stuff you could do. Last time I went home, my dad asked me if I wanted to go scuba diving. Uh, we've never done that before. He had a friend who could show us how it worked. And it was awesome. We went out for like half an hour. Uh, we're on the bottom, about to come up to the surface. And then dad just like very casually swims up to me, just reaches out his hand, grabs my breathing device thing, just kind of like rips it out of my mouth, <laughs> puts it into his own mouth, takes a big deep breath, and he like flips around, points at his oxygen gauge thing. My dad is completely out of air. Like, he's completely out on the bottom. And I'm so happy he took the time to point that out to me because before he did that, I was just very sure he was trying to murder me. Right? Like, very sure. I don't know if this is every father-son relationship, but when that happened, part of me just went like, yeah, I knew this day was coming. This was, yeah, okay. Right. Underwater, well played, old man. Good. Didn't expect that. So now we've got to go back and forth with my oxygen just to get to the surface, which I think we can agree that's, that's got to be the worst way to save your dad's life, right? Like, if I'd given him a kidney or dragged him out of a burning building or something, I'd never shut up about it. As it is, I saved my dad by, like, kind of making out with him. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know, what's the... What's the point of saving a dad you're never gonna look in the eyes again, you know? Like, why bother? Who cares? So we get to the surface, I'm furious. I'm like, Dad, what are you thinking? Like, you could see you're out of air, you didn't do anything about it till it was way too late. Like, what are you doing here? And I'm not making this up. He goes, yeah, Jack. No, I could see on the gauge, I could see I was out of air, but you know, I just assumed it'd be like a car, you know, where, <laughs> you know, it's sort of, it says you're out, but, you know. There's always, always a bit of wiggle room there. That is, by a wide margin, the craziest shit I've ever heard. Right? Like, we did a full day of scuba training, no one mentioned wiggle room once, okay? It wasn't part of it. And I want to give my dad the benefit of the doubt. Like, he's not a dumb guy, I just think he drives too much. Like, he's always in his car for work. And he's just looking at that fuel gauge. And it is a bit off, you know, there is a bit of wiggle room there. There's maybe a bigger issue than we're acknowledging that like the main piece of information we're all looking at all day, every day is wrong all the time. <laughs> it is maybe having an effect on the way we all see the world. Like, like this is my big conspiracy at the moment. I feel like that fuel gauge is everything. Like that's, that's why people stop trusting the media. That's like, uh, that's how Trump rose to power. It's like why people don't believe in climate change. You know, it's just, Guys like my dad staring at the climate data going, ah, well, this doesn't look good, but if the Earth's atmosphere is anything like my Holden Commodore, <laughs> should, should be good for a bit, I reckon. Should get us through the weekend, at least. Uh, my favorite part about growing up in a small town was the religious education at my school. It wasn't a religious school. It was like a public school where once a week we had a scripture lesson. And because the town was so small, it meant no one who lived there was qualified to teach this. Like no one had studied how to teach religion. So it just meant that I learned about God from any psychopath free on Wednesdays. That was it. It ruled. It was so much fun. We had like this one guy coming to the school. And by the way, religious education is the only school subject where teaching it like that is even an option. You know, like you can't do that with anything else. You're gonna be like, uh, listen kids, uh, none of us actually know long division, but Terry's got some theories, okay? <laughs> like... We 
Yeah, there's one guy coming to the school, and this is how he starts his speech. Okay? He hasn't mentioned God. He hasn't mentioned the Bible. He hasn't said his own name. This is his opening line of the speech. He just comes out and goes, If you're a man, don't have sex with men. <laughs> And it's like, I know that's what he believes, but buddy, you are pitching this at the wrong demographic, okay? I am 10 years old right now, okay? I don't want to have sex with anything, all right? Like, my dick has been hard once. It was the scariest day of my life, okay? Uh, thank God it never happened again, am I right, fellas? Right, right boys? <laughs> One and done, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh... I'm not religious. I, uh, I don't really want to make fun of religion, though, either. Like, I feel like it's so funny to me when you see comedians up there and they're, like, just trashing religion. It's always some guy who's like, oh, what? You know, two of every animal on one boat seems pretty bloody unlikely to me. It's like, well, yeah, but, you know, you're a 50-year-old man bombing at an open mic who genuinely believes he's about to get his own TV show. Like, that's not... You know, that's... Let's not mock people for having blind faith in the impossible while we're trying to have a career in the arts in Australia, you know? So, you know? I feel like in a weird way, the religious stuff I learned at school is like held up better than other stuff I learned at school because I, I finished school in 2008, which means that nothing that matters now was being talked about back then. You know, no one talked about social media, no one talked about mental health. Uh, I was thinking about this recently. I went to school for 12 years. No one mentioned consent once. We learned about triangles every day. <laughs> so like, yeah. Everyone's always like, what do we do about rape culture? It's like, let's give it like 6% of the triangle budget. Just see what happens. I don't know. Let's give it a crack. Um, I don't know. I am... I'm trying to get off social media at the moment is a big goal of mine. I heard about this study where they got, they got monkeys at the zoo, right? And they gave monkeys two options. They could either get their favorite treat or they could just look at videos of attractive monkeys. And every time, 100% of the time, the monkeys just wanted to look at the videos. They wanted to see attractive monkeys. I think it's very interesting about what it says about us and our own addiction to social media. But more than that, I just think it's a very interesting day for the scientist whose job it is to, like, decide which monkeys are attractive. <laughs> yeah. There's just some jobs you don't want to be, like, the best at, you know? <laughs> you don't want to be, like, known as the guy for that, like... Uh, you want to spot a hot monkey? You get Greg, okay? He knows, dude. He can tell. Because, like, you try and be all objective and scientific, but you know a bit of your own preference would have to come through somewhere. <laughs> you know. Like, you'd be trying to be all science-y. You're like, uh, you know, here we have a, a very strong musculature, uh, symmetrical features, good genetics, uh, kind of a cute smile as well. <laughs> you know? you know, sort of soft blue eyes you can really, <laughs> really lose yourself in. No, I do think uh, social media is bad for us. You know, you always hear this stuff about how damaging it is. You're always comparing yourself to these like idealized versions of people online, which I think, you know, that's it's a real problem. I think it's mostly an issue for younger people. I feel like older people kind of have the opposite problem. You know what I mean, like I think older people come across really well in real life. You know, old people, real life, a lot of dignity, you know? You, like, work at the same company for 50 years, you wear a suit every day, you show up on time, provide for the family, keep up with current events, give them an iPad for five minutes, they're just like, oh, minions are good, who wants my bank details? What do you think? Who's <laughs> clean? Um, and, like, I know it's very easy to make fun of old people for being bad at technology. Like, I get it's going to be so much worse for me. Like, technology is advancing so quickly. I'm pretty bad now. I'm 31 at the moment, which I think is a weird age to be. Being 31, it's like, it's not old or young. Being 31 just means if I get invited to a party, I have to physically arrive at that party before I know for sure if there's going to be newborn babies or cocaine. Uh, it's like, <laughs> Just like two very different types of 30-year-olds. Very different ideas on how to use disposable income. Just kind of united by the fact none of them are getting any sleep. Right? Um, 
But I'm pretty bad now with technology is my point. Like I get, um, I get all my news through Twitter. That's like the dumbest thing you can do. Like my whole worldview now is just people I don't know reacting to events I don't understand using GIFs from TV shows I haven't seen. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's a nightmare. I gotta watch RuPaul to understand the Ukraine. It's fine. <laughs> And like, it's just gonna get worse is the thing. Like technology advancing so quickly, you know, by the time I'm an old man, is everyone's gonna have their own sex robots in the future. It's gonna be living out their wildest sexual fantasies every night. I'm gonna be like the one old idiot who can't figure out the settings on mine. You know, I'm just, just stuck on the fetish menu for ages. I don't know what's going on. And my sex robot's just this big lizard creature I gotta deal with. <laughs> Just like old people today, I am too proud to admit I made a mistake. You know, like, no, this is what I wanted. This is what I always wanted. If scientists had stepped up to the plate, I would have been fucking this lizard years ago. Okay? Um, I do feel like I'm a lot happier when I'm away from technology. Like I, um, I did a big hike a few years ago. Me and my friend did this walk around in New Zealand. We walked around this mountain and it was like nine days out in the wilderness, no phones, no technology, it was awesome. But before the trip, my friend was like, hey man, we should do acid on this trip. And I was like, uh, I don't know, man, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not a big drug guy. He's like, trust me, dude, this'll be great because we'll be, we'll be alone, we'll be in nature, we'll be surrounded by like rivers and mountains and trees. You'll feel really connected to everything. This'll be great. And like, that does sound good, but only because rivers and mountains are good. You know, like just by themselves, they're good. Like, I don't need drugs to make good things great. Okay? I need drugs to make bad things fine. That's, you know, I feel like best case scenario with drugs, you're in like some horrible nightclub talking to the dumbest person you've ever met, just like loving every second of it. You're just like, Oh my God, you're starting a podcast? Dude, that is the best thing I've ever heard. It's incredible. Absolutely, I'll be a guest anytime. Like, that's what you want, you know? So we get out on the hike and it's amazing. We were like walking around this mountain. It's, it's off season, so we don't see anyone the whole time. It's this incredible experience. We get like seven days in. This is where we're gonna take the acid. We had it in the morning. We're just sitting out the front of the cabin where we're staying, just kind of waiting it for it to kick in. And then a helicopter just sort of landed next to us. <laughs> and this guy jumps out. He hasn't seen us yet. He just walks like right in front of where we're staying. Just starts like hammering in this sign. Just banging in this sign. And what the sign says, it's no words. It's just a, it's a biohazard symbol. <laughs> and a picture of a rat. Right? <laughs> So he puts this in, he sees us for the first time. He's terrified, everyone's terrified, but he turns around, he's like, oh, uh, boys, are you staying here? You're staying here at the moment? We're like, yeah, 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 we were planning on staying here. He's like, right, so um, what's happening is, just to let you know, uh, it's a lot of feral rats in this region, okay? A lot of feral rats, and what we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be up in the helicopters dropping poison on them, okay? <laughs> So if you see like eight or 10 helicopters flying around today, <laughs> that's what's going on. And he just gets in the helicopter and leaves. And like, I feel like that guy may have saved my life because it might not seem like a big deal for him to take the time to explain all of that to us. But let me tell you something. When you're, when you're alone on a mountain in a foreign country, You've just taken a tab of acid and government helicopters start throwing rat poison on you. So, you know, fuck, it feels good to know why, you know? You'll want to know why. Um, I'm trying to work on mental health stuff a bit at the moment. I, I saw a therapist for the first time last year, which was good. I, I don't know if I'm going to see the same guy again. The, this is true, the guy I saw, he was missing his front two teeth. And like, look, that's fine, okay, you can, <laughs> not having a go, you can be a therapist without your front teeth, but I think we can agree it doesn't help, you know? <laughs> like, 
doesn't make that job any easier. You know? I've never seen a man with no teeth and being like, ooh, I can't wait to be very vulnerable around this guy. You know? Excuse me, sir, will you accept money for my secrets? Is that... It was kind of awkward though, because like one of, the, one of the main things I wanted to talk to him about was that um, I kept having this dream where my teeth fell out. <laughs> and uh, just, he is not gonna want to hear about this. <laughs> you know? Just doesn't set the right tone for the relationship when like his actual life is the same as my worst nightmare. <laughs> you know? just, uh, It was good, you know, he helped me with some anxiety stuff I was going through, like, nothing he said really, just when he spoke it made kind of like a soothing whistling sound, like a, <laughs> a, a salty breeze across the ocean, it was nice. Um, the, the real main reason I wanted to talk to a therapist was to do with my old job. I used to be, used to be a writer on the TV show The Project, which was a cool job, you know, there's not a lot of uh, TV writing jobs in Australia. But a big part of the job was you had to respond to messages people sent in from the public. And you're probably thinking, that's, that's interesting, Jack. I wonder what kind of person sends an email uh, to a TV show. Um, kind of just dangerous maniacs, really. Just, just the most frightening people in the country, sort of having like direct access to me at all times. That was kind of the job. It was so insane. Like, honestly, it was, it was a job that should have been done by mental health professionals. It was done exclusively by stand-up comedians. That was, like, really think about that. Really think about that setup. That, be like if you called up Lifeline and Rodney Rood picked up. You know, what the? Um, it was a real window into just a very, like, dark part of society you don't really see. Like, they're very aggressive. They, some of the insults they used were just crazy. I'd never heard them before. Like, they love using the phrase oxygen thief, which is such a, if you really think about it, that's such an insane thing to say to someone. Like, that's so full on. Like, it doesn't matter what you believe politically. Like, we're all here together. No one's taking anyone else's oxygen. I mean, like, my dad, obviously. Okay, sure. But, you know, um, This is the best message we ever received while I was working at the project. Uh, so what happened was the show had just done a story about parenting. I come in the next morning, open up the computer, get this email. It's a subject line, parenting done right. <laughs> Body of the email, my son is seven years old. <laughs> It's the whole thing. It's the, whole, <laughs> the whole email. You know? Like, I don't have kids, I don't know how it works, but if you're here, if you're a parent and you're here, you got kids and they're not seven, you gotta have a good hard look at yourself, okay? Like, so I didn't have the best experience with therapy, but I think it's cool that it's kind of easier to talk about now. I think that's kind of, you know, one generation ago, you couldn't really talk about it at all. Now it's totally fine to talk about it enough to ruin most comedy nights if you want to. Um, I do think there's like a, a long way to go still. Like I think to make real progress, we've got to get to the point where mental health is just like the most boring generic small talk everyone's doing all the time. Like, uh, you know, commercial radio is just like, news, sport, trauma. Like, <laughs> People are calling in to win grand final tickets by guessing Dave Hughes' worst fear. You know, like, we got Simon from Wollongong on the line. Simon, what do you reckon, mate? It, oh, uh, g'day, boys. Is it dying alone? Ooh. Uh, very close, mate. It was being forgotten, but thanks for playing. Um, thanks for playing. We got... Foo Fighters coming up next, and if you just tuned in, the secret sound was Tears of Acceptance. Uh, We are gonna lose some things as well though. I think as mental health gets more like destigmatized, uh, one thing we're gonna lose is just the insane activities that men do to mask having depression. <laughs> you know, like just, it's 
like in a society where everyone can talk about their feelings, no one is spending 10 years fixing up an old truck, right? That's... I don't know, I feel like... I feel like men just get to this age where they've sort of seen their issues just like building up and building up. And it just gets to this critical point where they're like, all right, enough is enough. I've got to deal with this as a grown-up or just learn everything about World War II for no reason. <laughs> these, are, these are my options somehow. Uh, but I think the main thing that we're going to lose is my favorite type of TV ad. Because there's this TV ad that used to be really popular, and they don't do it anymore. Where basically the ad would be, it's like the guy comes out, he's like, It's Crazy Steve's Bargain Warehouse! These, <laughs> these prices are insane! <laughs> and kind of the premise is that the guy who runs our company is severely mentally ill. <laughs> and if you want to take advantage of that, you can. But you're welcome. And like, I understand why we don't do those ads anymore. Like I get you probably best not to use someone's mental, mental illness as a punchline. But I don't know, they're fun ads. Like it's a fun, <laughs> silly thing. Like I would love to see like a modern company try and do just a just an updated, more sort of sensitive, modern version of it. You know, like the guy comes out, he's like, it's crazy Steve's bargain warehouse. These prices are as crazy as I am, but you better get in quick because I am working on myself every single day. I am meditating, I am journaling. My capacity to love myself has never been stronger. So you better believe these low, low prices are not going to stay this low for very long. My wonderful therapist, Suzanne, said that these low prices are a perfect metaphor for my ongoing struggle with self-worth. <laughs> Everyone abandoned me when I was younger and now I think I gotta keep the prices low or you're gonna abandon me as well, but that is not fair. That's not how this works. I can set the price to whatever the fuck I want. I'm still a human being, something of love and dignity. I haven't seen my father in seven years, but last night I called him up. I said, Dad, I knew you were doing your best, and he said he was proud of me, and microwaves, $30. You know, just... You know, the last bit I'll say on, on mental health, and it's kind of, it's a bit dark, but just go with me. I'm not trying to be, like, <laughs> shocking or anything. But um, in the last, like, couple years, I've had uh, two friends of mine who told me, after the fact, they're doing good now, but they told me they'd gone through a period of, like, real depression where I got to the point where they were feeling suicidal. But what I think is interesting is both times they never said that. Right? They never said those words. Both times what they said was they were like, yeah, man, it's just things got really dark and... It got to the point where I was just thinking of killing myself or just like quitting everything and moving out to the country. And I just remember both times thinking like, I'm so sorry you went through that. I'm so happy this is something you can talk about now. But most of all, what a fucking terrible endorsement for living in the country that <laughs> is just like, you know. Like, yeah, kill yourself, move to the country. Same thing, who cares, whatever. And the part that really stresses me out is, I realized we need people to move to the country. That's a big issue. People move to the city for work. We need more people moving out to the country. And now I'm just genuinely concerned that maybe that's the best marketing angle to make that happen. <laughs> oh, it's like, don't want to live, but too afraid to die. Shepparton. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> um, before I go any further with this, I know I've got like a real weird voice. Um, I know I've got a strange accent. I was born in Canada. We moved here when I was like nine years old, I think. And I haven't really heard anyone else talk about this, but it's a very weird feeling to be an immigrant who's white and only speaks English, you know, because you, you don't feel Australian, but there's also no immigrant community either. You know, there's no Canadian immigrant community here. We don't all like hang out in the little Toronto and you know, <laughs> you know, eat pancakes and listen to Avril Lavigne. Every, 
like we did in the old country, you know? Um, I mean, it's just a weird feeling because you know, you don't feel Australian, but you can't really bond with other immigrants, I find. Like, I used to work with this Iraqi guy, and he's about the same age as me. He came to Australia about the same time as me. And one day on a lunch break, he was just telling me about how his family got to be in Australia. And it was like horrific. It was terrifying. He was just like one of the worst stories I've ever heard. He kind of just left when he was a little boy, just had to leave everything behind in the middle of the night. Uh, he left his dad. He had like a plan to meet up with his dad when they got to Australia, but he didn't know if he was ever going to see his dad again. And it just gets worse from there. It's just like getting chased through the deserts and like gun battles and pirates and smugglers. It's just horrible. And eventually they do get to Australia and he does meet up with his dad. And he ends the story by saying, Jack, the happiest day of my life was when me and my family, we all went to Canberra, we got to do our Australian citizenship ceremony, best day of my life. Like an idiot, I went, hey, I've done one of them. <laughs> and he's like a really nice guy. He's like, oh, cool, how'd your family get to be in Australia? And that was when I knew I'd really messed up. <laughs> because I knew the honest answer to that question was, Oh, my family got to Australia via Disneyland. <laughs> this is completely true. We flew from Vancouver to California, did two days in Disneyland, then flew from California to Sydney. And let me tell you something. You do not want to get stuck swapping immigration stories when yours involves the happiest place on earth. <laughs> Because there's no way I can spin this like we have anything in common. We're not going to bond over this. I can't be like, ah, oh, man, you know what it's like. Like, the lines are pretty long, you know, the, the food's expensive, you know. It's like, I lost my dad for a bit as well. You know, kind of like, you, know you get it. It's like, he was at Space Mountain. It was fine. Don't worry. I'm terrified of death, and it's... It's really the worst fear you can have because it's the fear that no one really wants to talk about. Like, no one knows how to talk about death. If you say you're afraid of death, people just go, hey, you know, it's, we're, we're all going to die. So, <laughs> yeah. How's that helping me here? Like, imagine telling someone your worst fear, the most comforting thing they have to say is that it definitely will happen. That's, <laughs> like, I'm afraid of clowns. Buddy, we're all going to get fucked by a clown. What are you talking about? Just grow up, dude. Um, I, know. I think it would be better if I had like some kind of faith in my life. Like I was talking about religion before. I know exactly why I'm not religious. I was talking before about the scripture teachers we had at my school. And there was one we had, I believe this was in year five. She was really nice. She wasn't like the guy I was talking about earlier. She was like really kind of like fun, pleasant, positive older lady. And she said that what we're going to do is we'll break the lessons into two halves. Okay, we're going to have the first half is going to be stories from the Bible. And the second half is going to be something she called God's miracle on earth. So she would just bring in something from nature that we could sort of have a look at, have a play with. Like the first time she brought in a sunflower. It's kind of nice. Look at it with a magnifying glass. That was sort of what the lesson was going to be. So that was week one. Week two, we do stories from the Bible. Then this time, she brings in a rat. Okay, it's like kind of a, it's like a cute, fluffy rat. You know, like a ratatouille-looking guy. It's nice. <laughs> this is where things get kind of interesting. Week three, we do stories from the Bible. This time, she brings in two rats. <laughs> Just the original rat. And then just one other rat. <laughs> I'm not making this up. For the rest of the school year, just more rats. <laughs> just more. And in the way that it started off with like kind of a cute, nice rat, like there was a harsh drop off in rat quality. Like, I don't know what was happening, what she was feeding them, how they were living, but. Also, it started off kind of like 50-50 stories from the Bible, God's miracle on earth. By the end, it was kind of like quick mention of the Bible, followed by just unsupervised rat time. I was just... So we just have this insanity through the whole year. 
there's like one week left before we break for summer and she sort of sits everyone down. She's like, all right, guys, you know, uh, I hope you've gotten something out of this. I hope you've had a great time with me this year. I know I learned so much from you. And I just wanted to say that before we break for summer, if you want one of the rats, <laughs> just come back next week, bring a note from your parents and five bucks. <laughs> So she's selling the rats, right? She's, she's selling the rats to kids. That's what's happening in here. And I, I have so many questions at this point as well. I'm like, when was, like, surely something's missing from that list. I feel like, note from your parents, five bucks, something to put a rat in, surely. Surely, if this didn't look suspicious enough, just like kids walking out of school, just loose handfuls of rats. Like, main thing I want to know is like, in her mind, when was the transition from scripture teacher to rat merchant? That's <laughs> so what I want to know is, did she already have the rats? That's if I could have one question answered in my life, that would be it. Like, did she already have those rats? Because like, one of two things happened here. Either she's just this crazy old lady with a house full of rats and she, she gets this job teaching religion at a school and she's like, ah, oh, perfect, I'll, I'll sell some of these fucking rats to the kids, great. Two birds with one stone, easy money, great. You know? That would be truly insane. But if that didn't happen, that only leaves one alternative, which is that she didn't have any rats. She got this job and her first reaction was like, well, I should get some rats, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to look unprofessional at my new job. Um, I'm very glad it happened. You know, I think I got, a, I got a good story out of it. I learned pretty early on religion wasn't really for me. Um, got, got 10 rats for 50 bucks. That ain't bad. I think the most interesting part about this to me is that I only learned pretty recently this is something I should even tell people about. I think when you're a kid, you sort of just assume people have your best interests in mind. You just assume people kind of know what they're doing. It was pretty recently, I was like at a party, someone was talking about religious education. They were like, oh man, it's such bullshit. You know, they brainwash you with all these outdated ideas. I'm like, yeah, tell me about it, man. Sell you a bunch of rats, you know. Oh, shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that. Um, I got one more uh, kind of main story I want to tell you guys, and um, it's kind of on a po leave on a positive note. This is a really not a story about me. This is a true story about the greatest actor in the world, Sylvester Stallone. Right? <laughs> because I love this story because I've looked into it, I've heard it a few times, I've researched it online. I believe this is a true story because before he was successful, before Rocky came out. Stallone was dead broke. He had nothing. He was living in this like shitty apartment in New York. He was just taking like any, you know, terrible, humiliating acting role he could do to get by. He was just selling everything he owned. He was just really struggling. Just him and his dog and his dream of being success. And that was it. One day, his buddy calls him up. He's got him a ticket to go see a boxing match. It's Muhammad Ali versus Chuck Wepner. And kind of the story going into the fight is that Chuck Wepner doesn't belong in this fight. He's not good enough. He's going to be a mismatch. Ali's going to knock him out in a couple rounds. This fight shouldn't be happening. And that's not what happens. Okay? It, Ali wins, but it's a war. They slug it out. They're bloodied up. Wepner like, knocks him down at one point. It's this incredible fight. So Chuck Wepner loses the fight, but kind of wins this moral victory. He's like, I stood in there with the best fighter in the world the whole time. I did it. And Stallone's there. He's in the crowd watching this gives him an idea for a movie. He goes back home, writes up the script for Rocky, starts trying to shop it around, starts trying to sell the script. And there's a lot of interest in it. People really like it. For the first time in his life, he's done something that people really connect with and they want to buy the script. But he's not a known actor at all. No one knows who Stallone is. So they're like, we'll buy the script from you, but we're going to cast someone else. And even though he's got nothing, he's dead broke, he's really struggling, he won't sell. He's like, you don't understand. I got to be Rocky. This is my destiny. I got to be an actor. I can't sell you the script until I'm Rocky. And so he just hangs on, hangs on as long as he can. So he sells everything he owns. And it gets so bad, he sells his dog. It's like all he's got in his life. He sells his dog to some guy out the front of a liquor store for like 50 bucks. He just hangs on as long as he can. Eventually the studio's cave. They're like, okay, whatever. We'll pay you less money for the script, but you can be Rocky. 
And the rest is history, right? He makes it, it's a smash hit, Academy Award, he's done it. He bet on himself and he won so big. He's like, he's young, he's rich, he can do whatever he wants. First thing he does when he gets his Rocky money, he goes to the liquor store where he sold his dog and he just waits there. He waits there day in, day out, until he sees the same guy who he sold his dog to. He buys his dog back for $15,000. <laughs> uh, I love that story. It's a very beautiful story about a man who believed in his art, loved his dog, but he knew he had to sacrifice for his dream. But as well as that, it's also a very weird story about a man who made $15,000 <laughs> because he liked buying dogs on the street from strangers, like... That's not a good business plan, you know? No financial advisor is gonna tell you to, like, buy and sell the same dog to and from Sylvester Stallone. Like, people talk about Rocky being an underdog story, like, that is an underdog story, I would... I would pay anything to see him like coming home that night, like kicks the door open. He's like, good news, baby. The speculative celebrity dog buying business is finally paying off. All right, I got 15 grand in my pocket. I'm taking you out to dinner then I'm putting the rest back in the company. I'm hitting the streets, I'm buying more dogs. We're gonna be millionaires by Christmas. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out to this. Thank you so much. Hey, if you watched through all of that, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, this is just an independent thing. I just wanted to do this myself and put it on YouTube. So if you want to support this, there's a donation link in the description. Chuck in a few bucks, buy me a coffee. I'd really appreciate that. It all goes towards making more stuff like this in the future. And if you've got no money, totally understand that. Just uh, please subscribe and send this to someone you think would like it. That would be the best. Thanks.